everyone had a hand in last night's wild card victory for the Diamondbacks. And with a new coach leading ASU women's soccer, the Sun Devils are experiencing a culture change. This is Cronkite Sports Now. Hello everyone and welcome to Cronkite Sports Now. I'm Amanda Whitaker. The Arizona Diamondbacks kept their season alive after surviving a roller coaster National League wildcard game last night at Chase Field. Cronkite News reporter Andy Krause was there to see how the D-backs earned their spot in the next round of the postseason. The Diamondbacks defeated the Colorado Rockies 11-8 in an NL wildcard game that certainly lived up to its name. The Diamondbacks jumped out to an early 6-0 lead in the first three innings. Highlighted by Paul Goldschmidt's no-doubt shot over the left field fence in the bottom of the first. But the Rockies would battle back with a four-run rally in the top of the fourth, chasing starter Zach Greinke from the game. Then it was the Archie Bradley show, for better and for worse. He hit a two-run triple in the bottom of the seventh that appeared to break the game open. But that was canceled out in the top of the eighth when he gave up back-to-back -back home runs to Nolan Arenado and Trevor Story. It was A.J. Pollock's two-out, two-RBI triple in the bottom of the eighth that put the game away for Arizona. Manager Torrey Lovello, relief pitcher Archie Bradley, and third baseman Jake Lamb give their perspective on how they saw Bradley's hit that had the crowd going louder than at any other point in the game. What I want to say, Archie, is he's built for that moment. That's his personality. Um, you know, you're talking about an elite high school athlete that understands what it's like to be on the big stage. Um, he steps up and he loves to be in that environment, and uh, it translated. You know, they say hindsight's 2020. I would have much rather just taken a nice jog into second base, stood up, and, and taken my double there, but it's just kind of who I am. You know, I, I don't know any other way to play, so I was going to run as hard as I could until they told me to stop. But yeah, the. The whole bat, the triple, the moment, it's something I'll never forget. You know, that's the, it's the type of uh, a bat you dream about. You know, being a, a guy in the bullpen, getting to have a big at bat in the eighth inning of a wild card game with guys on base and then to drive them in was just, uh, it's a moment I'll never forget. I'm going to regret this, but it was, it has to be Archie's, you know, knock. It was, uh, it was one of those moments where I hate to say this in front of him, but, you know, the pitcher's up, two outs. You're not expecting a whole lot. And he puts this Hall of Fame type swing on, <laughs> on, a, on a pitch. And yeah, the whole place went nuts. And obviously what happened the next inning um, happened. But I think it was just one of those things that you are not expecting that whatsoever. Um, maybe a base hit, but not, not a trip like that. So that was, that was a big, big moment. Now it's off to Los Angeles for the Diamondbacks, where they'll be taking on the team with the best record in baseball in the National League Division Series but they won't be heading into Dodger Stadium feeling intimidated. Not only did they win the season series 11 to eight, they've also won their last six contests against the Dodgers, outscoring them 40 to 13 in those games. From Chase Field, Andy Kraus, Cronkite News. The Diamondbacks have yet to announce who will start game one of the NLDS against Clayton Kershaw and the Dodgers tomorrow night. But Lavello did say in last night's postgame conference that the candidates are Taiwan Walker, Patrick Corbin, and Zach Godley. And now for our tweet of the day. MLB Stat of the Day tweeted, the D-backs are the first team to hit four triples in a postseason game since the 1903 Red Sox. They included a compilation gif with hits from last night's NL wildcard game. There is nearly a completely different look to this year's ASU women's soccer team headlined by the addition of a new head coach. Cronkite News reporter Drew Andre tells us about the culture change within the team. I wanted to coach at the highest level and I believe that um, Arizona State has the ability to become the number one team in the nation and I'm, uh, I'm not going to stop until that happens. High hopes from the new ASU soccer head coach Graham Winkworth. The New England native spent the last four seasons bringing South Alabama soccer to prominence, sending them to four consecutive trips to the NCAA tournament. But he felt it was time to field other offers, and Ray Anderson and Arizona State were very convincing. That was a huge pulling factor, and then when you, when you land back in Alabama and, and they've sent your wife some flowers because they want you to come here, it's a, it's a nice touch. Winkworth wasn't just wooed by ASU. He felt this was the best place for him to succeed. Winkworth's predecessor, Kevin Boyd, was responsible for recruiting all but three women on this season's team, including freshman Olive Jones, 
who made the tough decision to stick with her commitment to ASU. It was kind of upsetting, so of course I, I cried a little bit. So I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, should I stay here? Should I leave? Fortunate enough, uh, we got Graham, who is an amazing coach. I love him so far. With the new coach brings a new team dynamic, and players who are already on the team have to begin to buy into a totally different system. And it had to start with the older players on the team to set an example. As a leader, if I was able to show that I trusted the coaches and was bought into the process of transition, then hopefully um, I could you know, spread that to the team and they would follow as well. Not everyone on the team is new to Winkworth's style, as he managed to bring over his star from South Alabama, the 2016 Sunbelt Player of the Year, Gemma Perfield. So I had to think about like my own success, but I also had to think about my own development. And when I weighed up the pros and cons and came to visit here, uh, I saw the facilities, I saw the girls, and it just seemed like an amazing place, and I realized that to further my development here was the place to do it. It's not easy to mesh a new group together, and Winkworth acknowledges that many would consider this a rebuilding year for the program. But his goal is to bring a new foundation to the team, and players are buying in. In Tempe, Drew Andre, Cronkite News. The Sun Devils are currently 1-1-1 one, one, and one in conference play and will take on the number one team in the country, UCLA, in Tempe tonight at 7. Looking ahead to the weekend, Arizona sports fans can cheer from home as teams hit the road. The Diamondbacks head to Los Angeles on Friday to kick off the best of five National League Division Series against the Dodgers. Game two will be played on Saturday. The Coyotes also head to Southern California to face the Ducks tonight in their first game of the season. They return home to play the Vegas Golden Knights on Saturday. On Tuesday, they travel to Vegas to play the Knights at T-Mobile Arena, just one mile from Mandalay Bay, where the recent attacks on concert goers occurred. Along with the NHL, the Coyotes have set up a donation page to help raise funds for the victims and first responders of the Las Vegas tragedy on Sunday. The Vegas Strong campaign launched this morning, and the donation page will be open through the end of the Coyotes game against the Golden Knights on Saturday. To donate, go to www.arizonacoyotes.com slash Vegas strong. Phoenix has a large transplant population, and it's probably no more evident than in the collection of sports team bars in the Valley. As the Cardinals head to Philadelphia on Sunday, this week we look at a local Eagles bar in Old Town Scottsdale. To put it lightly, Eagles fans can be considered passionate following their team wherever they go and in some places they haven't gone in a while. The last time the Eagles were in Arizona was in 2014, and coincidentally, that's when the Eagles West Fan Club started and found its home at the Rock Bar in Old Town Scottsdale. A Rock Bar is the home of Eagles West, and to be perfectly honest, it is a partnership between the fan club, between the bar, and between the two of us, we're able to put this whole thing together so these fans can come here every week and have that experience. Philly native Paul Zarina says this is a place for fans to come together and escape for three hours. And according to some other Philly natives, the atmosphere at Rock Bar is better than those at bars back home. Been in the bars, it's like they don't they don't do the chants. I mean, I think maybe because there's so much, you know, Eagles fan that they okay they, they they cheer and they love the Eagles, but it's not like we're out here and it's like we're seeing our team. We, we love our team. It's incredible. The atmosphere is great. Uh, everybody's got their jerseys on. Everybody's screaming and yelling. Everybody's mad when we do something wrong. Everybody's happy when we do something good. The passion is what helps create this atmosphere, and this passion can start from a very young age. I'll do anything to be an Eagles fan. I would eat a whole bag of Skittles to do anything. The Eagles fans at Rock Bar help foster and breed this loyal fan base from giveaways. This. <laughs> The Cardinals play the Eagles Sunday in Philadelphia at 10 a.m. The Eagles are 3-1 on the season, whereas the Cardinals look to keep their head above water and eclipse the 500 mark. If you'd like to see our sports stories from across the valley, head to the Cronkite Sports section on ArizonaSports.com. For continuing Arizona news and updates throughout the day, check out CronkiteNews.azpbs.org and join us at 5 p.m. on Arizona PBS. 
That's it for this Thursday edition of Cronkite Sports Now. For all of us here at Cronkite News, I'm Amanda Whitaker. Thanks for joining us.